on for the last uh, session of the day uh, before we let you go for some, uh, sorry, that's it, that's the caffeine, the wine and the beers. So uh, Fabian Bartnick uh, is now with Tune Hotels, uh, formerly with Ideas, so deserted, uh, deserted that company and decided to uh, <coughs> go work uh, in Malaysia. Uh, you should ask him how he enjoys his time there. Um, they were going to put him at the uh, at the at the KL airports. So if anyone sort of been in that area, you'd know it's uh, another city away from KL. And so uh, you were lucky that they actually put you up in town, which is good. Um, so Fab Fabian's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, pricing and distribution, bar rates and uh, strategies around pricing. So uh, and he's got a few people to help him. Is that right? Okay. So uh, take it away, Fabian. Hi, so as Monique said, uh, I'm the guy after coffee before beer. Um, should be about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how awake you are or how thirsty you are. To kick it off, I'm, I'm not that good with embedding videos and stuff like that, so uh, we got to do it the old school way. But I want to uh, kick it off with a little video. I would probably go to Africa because I want to discover a new country. Or England maybe? To Russia so then I can see Santa. Have to be a country. America, Russia, Canada, India, New Zealand, Mickey Elmo Millie, Dewey Tin Shop, Hans Chasa, Itini San Higora, Una Dewey Terracotta. being old school. No, it's okay, you can move them over. The key question really is with knowing what our future generation wants for travel, is are our pricing and distribution best practices really working? Thank you very much, sir. One thing is clear, we love travel. Humanity just loves to go out there and explore. And there are different generations. There's us, there's the millennials, and then there's Generation Alpha just around the corner. Now in order to understand where we might be want to go, we need to understand where we come from. So if we quickly just take a look at a couple of milestones in history of travel. I'm not here today to tell you about, oh, do this, do that, right? It's too late in the afternoon for that. But what I'm trying to do is trying to show you uh, 
what's out there at the moment, right? What hotels actively doing? What we, um, as well in the company that I work for, do on a daily basis. Then we have the panelists coming on and you can ask them any questions to make sure that we're getting the best out of these experts to understand what is really around the corner and what can we do better as hoteliers, as vendors, as partners in crime in the distribution landscape and the pricing landscape. So in the beginning there was really creation, right? So we needed transport to go from A to B. That might have been cars, that would have been your lovely aeroplanes further down the line, but equally it started generally with the trains. But the trains needed to go somewhere, so we had hotels to accommodate that need. After the creation, really, it was all about automation. The automation really was the GDS developed, and we had a couple of wholesalers, such as uh, Thomas Cook coming up and being really the first one out there to commercially make it viable. Before we ended up in a couple of years ago when the innovation started. And the innovation was all about the internet really becoming commercial. Commercial in the sense that you did not need to go to a travel agent anymore, but you were able to do it yourself. So DIY in travel, so to speak. Things like Expedia came back from that. And then, of course, we're coming into the disruptive age. And it's really about uh, user-generated content. It's about meta-search. Uh, it's about social media. It's all the fun and loving stuff that is creating us headaches at the moment. So where does it leave us today? I'm sure some of you might have seen that graph beforehand. It's the jungle out there, right? And while it's troublesome, it's also fun, but it's a bloody mess. And if we look at that, we just think, crikey, how am I going to get through that in a day? And why is it important for us? Well, we are in the business of dealing with guests, right? They're the guys that come through our doors, pay our bills. Uh, depending on where they come from, they make us more money. So if we look at it from a, from a different perspective, we can look at it from a cost of acquisition point of view, right? And if you're an independent hotel, fair enough, I could make it way more complicated. But in essence, um, how to best say that? We're a bit like donkeys that beep gold coins. It seems like on every stage, we give money out in order to connect to the GDS, to the channel, to direct connect. We've got to pay somebody to do that for us. We pay a fee, commission, so on and so forth. And then we're going one step further before we then actually hit the gas. We also got to pay another commission on top of that. And that's our distribution landscape. Right? And then the guests will come back and tell us afterwards if the money we invested was actually right by saying good or bad. At a chain level, it becomes then a bit more, um, more tricky. You can point those arrows at different items. So am I going to have a central reservation or not? Do I really need it? But every time I go into it, I got to pay for it as a pass-through cost, as a direct connection fee. Do I do it via uh, a channel manager? then I got to pay the channel manager and still the other fee before I then end up and pay even more commissions on top of that. Now the reason why I'm a bit passionate about that is because we are in the process at Tune at the moment to build a distribution landscape from scratch. Yeah, you heard right, we don't have technology, right? We don't do that. So now we have. And that comes up with a wonderful opportunity, but a lot of headaches. Because if I point it to the left, it costs me $2. If I point it to the right, it costs me 5,000 right now, but then nothing after that. So how do I best sell that? Because I'm the brand owner to my franchisees and my owner. And then equally, what makes sense in the overall scheme of things? And then, of course, we want to throw in 
analytics tools, back-end finance systems, revenue management tools on top of that. But at all levels of the distribution, we seem to be not giving money away, but paying to acquire a customer that we also could get via brand, hotel direct, or call center at potentially a lower charge. And then we can't forget about the guests, right? Let's call them consumers because we are also consumers. So we always talk about generation Y, we're also talking about generation X. Me personally, uh, depending on which side you look, I'm both. Generation X, generation Y, so if you are around the 1980, you're in the same kind of predicament. But we're kind of the MTV generation, I would say, right? We grew up with MTV on TV. We know what a Commodore 64 is, and we played Snake on our Tetris, uh, on our uh, Nokia device. If you don't know Snake, you are not MTV generation. <laughs> if you don't know what the thing in the left is, again, you talked about Lotus, right? Talk about Walkman. And then, of course, the very first one, the Netscape. Now oh, that was a beauty. If you wanted to connect, you heard the dial-up, and AOL would actually send you a CD to put into your computer to connect to the internet. <laughs> if I look at Facebook, I would say we all were early adopters. Good on all of us for spotting that trend before it hit mainstream. Overall, though, I can say it's a great turn. Um, our phones might have not been smart, but we got by. My point is the consumer has changed. And I'm pretty sure over the next two slides, you will most probably be recognizing 99% of the stuff that I throw at you. Yeah, everybody's nodding, right? We had Facebook, we had Instagram, we had Pinterest. Easy. Next round. The one on the left is a mobile phone. <laughs> okay? We went from phone to WhatsApp to uh, Facebook messaging to Snapchat. And then we also changed the way we consume information. So we started off with pictures. Pictures was really great. When I started in the industry, it was all about make a nice, pretty picture of that bed and then put 50 pictures of beds on your website. Right? Nobody had any idea that nobody was actually looking at that. Then we moved over to videos. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Before Twitter came on board and said, like, hey, now you are able to tell everybody that you just got off the toilet. Right? But we're taking it one step further with Meerkat now, you can live stream that session. <laughs> right? And then the bottom right, the one with a now. Now, it has about five million users by now. So it's relatively small in the overall thing. But this is all about self-promoting. So target audience is 13 to 18. But well, what you can do is you switch on your mobile phone, you sit and you talk. Right? You are your own host of your own television show, so to speak. It's fantastic. If you watch it, it's hilarious what people do. <laughs> right? My point is, <laughs> these are the guys that will stay in our hotel soon. Right? So are we prepared for them? We then had innovation and disruption as far as technology is concerned in the form of, we had Bluetooth to start off with. Back in our days, you saw somebody on the street talking to themselves, wasn't a good thing, <laughs> right? You moved away. We then went over to GPS, wireless, we have G4, we have near field communication, and then the newest thing around the corner is iBeacon, right? Already tested in the retail space. We had books, granted. Uh, we moved to TV, then we got the iPod. We moved over to multi-device mobile to end up at our wearables. 
Now, three weeks ago, you could have said like, ooh, those wearables, hey? Now all launched and apps actually out there already connecting to that, fantastic. Bit expensive if you ask me, but let's see what the future holds. And then of course you move from cash to credit cards and now Bitcoin. Who of you accepts Bitcoin? He just asked what's Bitcoin? <laughs> Good question. Uh, it's a currency. <laughs> <laughs> but you can earn money by using your computer, blah, 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 blah. A lot of computers. Our customer is savvy, informed, opinionated, and very, very connected. Back in the day, we had brochures. Now, before they go out, no need for brochure. We're going to Google Maps, and I go to TripAdvisor. Um, once I get there, I have to go there. I just use Waze to wherever I need to go. And then, if I want tours and attractions, I have apps for that. I need my itinerary plan. Hey, I can do that, and I can actually now, with my geolocation, wherever I want, get my taxi to wherever I want. And I can tell everybody around me that I'm actually going there. Our customers are well informed. And there's much, 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 much more out of it. Now, it's not only our customer that has changed. I mean, I know hospitality is generally 10 years behind everybody else, but we have also changed. All of that stuff is nothing where you go like, wow, I've never seen that in my life. Chances are all of them have one of those apps on your mobile phone. Does anybody not have a mobile phone? <laughs> Let me rephrase. Does everybody in this room has a smartphone, yes? But when we really try to drill it down, it comes down to two items, in my opinion. Transparency and choice, right? The consumer today has so much choice. And our distribution landscape is extremely transparent right now. Back in the day, you went to the travel agent. You looked at the brochure. You asked for the price. You got the price. It took way too long to find another price. So you booked. Now you use, what was the statistic, 20 plus sites to actually look before you make your decision. The consumer knows us better than we do after that. Or so it feels like it. And they have a choice where they book because they don't care about our cost of acquisition. They care about what's in it for me. Right? If I get my loyalty points at an OTA, I will book through that OTA. Right? If I book through a loyalty with Hilton whatsoever, I will book through that. Now try and explain that to one of your friends. Right? That's what I do for a living. I look after my distribution landscape. Now let's talk a bit of pricing. And when we talk about pricing, we have a couple of specialists in the room, which is fantastic. Uh, literally all of us, right? When we look at pricing evolution, it started with a flat rate, one for all. Happy days, easy life. I think you referenced it early, right? Hundred dollar, take it or leave it, done, right? That's a fair approach. Doesn't make us the most amount of money. So then we said like, ah, oh, can I forget that? And let's do what we call bar. So in order to make bar work, we built a bar structure. Generally, I believe from my old ideas days, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Charles, uh, any hotels has from like 10 to 100 bar rates, but in average they have about 12, 13. Yeah, 12 to 13 bar levels, which the analytics behind it is incredible. 100, 105, 110, 115, 
120. And then we go up until we hit 10 because then it gets a bit too much. And then we came along and said like, hey guys, we need segmentation. So we started segmenting. We have wholesale, we have travel agent, we have corporate, we have groups. And then we realized, whoops, it doesn't always fit with each other. Some of my bar levels, now I get phone calls from my sales guys telling me uh, they can get a cheaper rate online. Can you please change your rate online? And when you try to have the argument about different customer, you lose. But we also have derivatives, and again, we're doing static derivatives. So what do we have today? 20%. Okay, tomorrow, 25%. Okay, 50%. And again, if we overlay that, it kind of all muddled together. <coughs> and if somebody books through booking.com, do we really know if it's a business or a leisure traveler? Do we? I booked through booking.com this time around, mainly because when I went to the front desk, they said our rec rate is 200. I give it for you for 190. If you go to booking, you get it for 180. <laughs> I said, fair enough. I will go to booking.com. <laughs> and then the online travel agencies came, and they were big on their rate parity thing, right? No, nope. everybody has the same rate. Happy days. Uh, I could put a lot of on there, but I think it's going to be a two, two horse race here. Expedia and Priceline considering they're a bit in a Christmas shopping mode um, over the last couple of months. And then we had merchant models and agent models. And I remember when they first started, I was told, oh, but Expedia's rate is so low compared to booking.com, so we don't want Expedia. It's different models. And now it's very well accepted across the industry. But we're moving away from rate parity. And I think Eric brought it up earlier. This morning, I think Sweden came out saying, no, no, not anymore. Um, globally, we're not there yet. But should we have rate parity? If you ask me, nah. If I buy my Sony television at a Sony center, I pay more than I buy at courts. Right? So why should it be different in the hotel space? That's just an a slide that I want, if somebody has the answer for me, please give me. Whenever you call an OTA and ask them how can I improve my ranking, it's always discount or it's always commission. <laughs> right? Pay me more commission, better ranking. Okay. Give me more discount, better ranking. Okay. <laughs> I don't like that. And then we have a couple of concepts. So you have seen the, the flash sales. I don't know if it's a trend, if it will continue or just die out. Um, social media, when it came out, everybody was like, ooh, new channel. Now everybody's like, don't know. Could be one, could not be one. Is it a segment? Don't know. What do you do with it? I like. <laughs> right? If we then move on and see something like geotagging with Expedia. So now you sit in Korea, better rate. You sit in Australia? No. I was told the best way to book Bali in case somebody go there, uh, go through the Australian site. At the moment, very good. <laughs> um, and then we have Hotel Quickly, and we have one of the co-founders here today. Where? Ah, over there, hello. Who sits on the panel later? So welcome, I'll let you talk about that later. Uh, but a last minute app. Right? We have seen other ones coming on board, such as Hotel Tonight, for example. And then sentiment pricing. And Kelly made a wonderful uh, presentation about the entire impact. Boy, that's another thing we have to take into consideration when you're pricing. Seriously. So now we take that into consideration as well. And we only know when my price was right when the guy leaves. Right? So who do we need to trust right now? Our trusted friends in operations. Oh boy. And then we're going to Sea Trip and Turico, right? So Sea Trip buying the offline rates for my members only. And I know Agoda does it, right? Failing to mention it's about 130 million members, right? 
So what do I need to do to qualify? Uh, nothing, you just sign up. And then of course, somebody like Turi uh, Turico Holidays, they came out in Kuala Lumpur and said, hey hotels, we need 500 rooms daily and we're going to pay you for it. And if we don't use it, you still get the money. Happy days. And then you look in the terms and conditions, you kind of go like, Mah. let's review. But it's still out there, right? So is the offline, the B2B rates, that strictly were B2B, now B2B to B2C to C to B, to B2B? To B? <laughs> Don't know. All I know is that purely on the B2B basis, when we switched on C-Trip for June, it generated from zero to 50 bookings in a day, right? Without doing anything, was just putting a signature on there. And that can only keep on growing. And then corporate pricing. So we had corporate price, everybody gets the same, then somebody said, ooh, let's go dynamic, fixed, hmm, we can do both. Uh, we then need to consider if it's commissionable or non-commissionable, and then we gotta decide if it's last room availability or not last room availability, and then we wanna change it to room type last room availability or house room time availability or not. And don't forget, you gotta do that by room type or by bad configuration. And now the cool new things, right? Continuous <coughs> pricing, price optimization, whatever you want to name it, it just means no intervals, no level, dynamic from zero to 100. A bit like a Ferrari, going through all the way, right? We still have to figure out at what decimal point we're actually going to change the rate because it becomes very annoying, I can imagine. And then, of course, decoy pricing. Everybody talks about it, but even Apple does it. Right, who of you has a 5C? <coughs> who of you has a 5? Huh? You have a 6, right? Okay. Do you work in the Chinese market? Do you have 5C? Do you have 5S? Oh, crap. Could have said yes, couldn't you, Brian? <laughs> Please. So do you have a 5S, Brian? <laughs> oh, fantastic. You see? Working. We use decoy pricing for our hotel chain. And we have seen some success with it um, by bundling the products in a way to actually say it would appear to different geographics. Um, so it allows the right product to be bought if you hit certain criteria. And it's working. It makes more money for us and it gives us one more data point to actually look at and fine tune that uh, value preposition. And then we got to do all of that and still look at the cost of acquisition. My head hurts. It was so much easier a couple of years ago. And then we're talking ancillary revenue. Right? But it's working. It's just very complicated. It makes it much harder for us to explain to somebody what we actually do for a living. And now we're talking wearables. So next time my fridge tells me you're out of beer. Or it makes an online order for me at Tesco directly. How awesome would that be? And my watch will tell me they're at the door. And of course, guys, I don't know how you're still keeping up with all of that, but I'm very interested to hear about that once you guys come on the panel. So what's next? A couple of years, the trend word was OTAs. Then what was another trend word? Oh, social media was a trend word, definitely. Uh, search seems to be a big one at the moment, but equally, it seems to be real time. It seems to be relevant. It seems to be seamless, and it seems to be personalized. And if we look at our consumer today, or even if we just look at ourselves, right? Who of you gets annoyed if your mobile connection takes more than 10 seconds? Right? Absolutely, you got absolutely potty, right? Because you want it then and there, right? And you gotta make sure that it's relevant for me at this point in time. When I get these text messages that offer me something, 
it really annoys me. And you get them over and over and over again. What I like is if I use my phone and then I go to my iPad, it seamlessly syncs from one to the other. Fantastic, right? I don't have to double entry. I get it done once. And equally, if I want to start a booking process here, I want to finish it somewhere else and vice versa. And then, of course, we all feel this, this personalization thing. It needs to be me and it needs to be addressed to me. It needs to hit the right tones for me to act upon. And it makes me feel special, come on. So our pricing and distribution best practices today, are they really working today? Are they able to deliver that? I'm not 100% sure. And are they future proof? So, without further ado, I would love to invite the panel of the day to come to the stage, please. Um, we've got Patrick Anders, Executive Vice President from Asia Pacific Duero. Please give him a big welcome. Have a seat. <laughs> we then have Eric Munoz, Chief Marketing Officer from Price Match. The lady of the round, Priyanka. Where are you? There you are, from TripAdvisor. We got Thomas, co founder and CEO of HQ, and then we have Matthew Stevens, vice president from eHotelier. It's a very informal session, right? So if you have questions, just shout them out, right? If they say something you don't like, throw something, anything. Right? Um, if you like something they say, clap your hands and give them a big cheer. Right? It makes them feel special. You're personalizing their experience. <laughs> See that one? So, boys and girls, how are you doing today? Great. Good? What are the best practices today in distribution and pricing? We have five top experts there. Everybody's like, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to put do myself it out there. And own it. And that concludes our session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. I was surprised they weren't clapping. No, but seriously, you have to distribute, right? You, you mentioned in your slides that distribution costs something, but it also brings value. Um, the hospitality industry isn't unique in that it distributes its products, right? If I have a factory that produces socks somewhere, I'm going to distribute my product, and it's going to cost me money to distribute that product. When I say own it, um, I think one of the big dangers is that um, there are some very powerful channels which are definitely trying to own um, own the customer, own the distribution, own, um, to a certain degree, the, the hotel, um, and, and that's a risk to the industry. I Th thank you, please quiet down. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, completely agree, and just to take that a step further, on the distribution side, I think, it'll, as you said, Fabian, cost of acquisition. And I think a lot of hotels, whether big chains and in smaller dependents alike, really don't understand their costs of acquisition, um, um, when you factor everything in, not, the, what's, not, not, not what's your OTA commission, but what's, ev what's all of your costs, website, SEO, demand generation, sales and marketing personnel, I don't think anyone really knows their true cost of acquisition. So if you look at a very high level, why are Ctrip, Expedia, Booking.com, Agoda, why are, they, why are they so successful? They're really efficient marketing machines. Their marketing efficiency uh, really drives their profitability. They can spend 1.8 billion with Google AdWords every year and turn that into a market capitalization of 74 billion, for example, with, with Priceline. So when we, if we look at that, 
it's all about marketing efficiency, right? So understanding the ROI and not saying, well, here's my monthly budget. If your investment is giving you a strong ROI, why wouldn't you just keep throwing money at it? And one of our speakers this morning, I think, mentioned um, if you can measure it, you can manage it. I think that's the golden rule in, in, in marketing, is to be able to measure it and monitor your ROI. So across the distribution landscape, you gave a really good example about C-Trip, right? Without doing nothing other than signing the thing and uploading the pictures, the how many how many bed photos did you put up there? No, not anymore. Okay, we good. took the pictures down, yeah. right, of the bed. And then you, I think, did 50 more bookings per day. Yeah. And if you look at it, I'm, I'm from Sydney originally, and there's um, a really successful operator, you know them as well, uh, Meriton. Has anyone ever heard of Meriton? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> In Europe, no one's ever heard of Meriton. Um, they're now 15 properties, are now service departments, l luxury, um, you know, five hotels in, in uh, Sydney. Anyway, over several years, because uh, they res report to the owner of the building, Mr. Triggerbot, over several years, they basically have now got distribution down to two channels, Booking.com and TripAdvisor. <laughs> now, a and their direct channel. They do oh, and direct. Well oh, sorry. sorry. And, and you know what? Um, I'm not giving anything away commercially here by saying that several years ago, um, when they were an unknown brand in Europe, and, and today they're still an unknown brand, uh, I, I, I can tell you, no one's ever said they know merit, and you just surprised surprise me here. Um, they, you, you talk about how do you get your ranking, and Booking.com says it's the seven C's. Well, the C that stands for commission has a high influence on, on ranking. They would not mind during certain times to be 45% 40, commission. For them, what was paramount was page one of Google because their apartment product is studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. Guess what? The European guests, long lead time, longer average length of stay, t uh, premium booking value, and they're not booking studios. They're booking twos and three bedrooms, which is where they're upgrading from their uh, oversold lower categories. So over time, they've been able, been able to optimize that and then invest everything they could on um, guest amenities. So really nice, uh, what do you call it? Soap things, amenities. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm jet sorry, sorry, I don't know that in my hotels and you pay and for that. And <laughs> 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 That's true. <laughs> I always get it included, thanks for that. But, uh, but, nope. um, but uh, on TripAdvisor, so yes, instant booking, right, at maybe 12%. But that, as Kelly was talking about today, in terms of uh, leisure in particular, travelers, they invest in what I call under-promising and over-delivering. You know what shocked me? Like, they've got a, some couple of okay hotels, but um, just a few months ago, five of the, was it, yeah, five. The top five hotels as um, are, uh, ranked by TripAdvisor, they're three of the top five in Sydney. Yes. Park Height wasn't there. Four, so are you, it's true. Uh, they work towards it. They worked for it. <laughs> this has been a long strategy to optimize TripAdvisor. I, I keep so it... So tell us, is that the right way? Sorry, give him some water. Yeah, sorry. Um. <laughs> just give him some water. He needs to liquidate those. Is that the right thing to do? Did they do it right? Should all hotels follow that? Um, I'm going to take off from something I've been hearing a lot, and that's cost of acquisition. And also what you just mentioned about um, focusing on a few channels, let's say. I'm not going to say two channels. But what I find, and at TripAdvisor, we deal with both OTAs and hotel chains for distribution, right? They both distribute through us. I see a differentiation in the way marketing and revenue departments are separated in hotels versus OTAs. So let's say, for example, uh, the revenue uh, person in a hotel, if I'm talking to them, they're talking about cost of acquisition. They're saying, ROI, if you give me this much ROI, I have, uh, I can work with you at a commission. Go ahead. You know, there's no cap on how many bookings you can bring in. The same discussion with a marketing executive in the same hotel chain, and they will say, I have a marketing budget, and if you're working on CPCs, then this is the budget that we have to spend with you. Um, what we see different in OTAs is that it's a blend of the two. Uh, they are 
using the revenue that they're generating to fuel marketing in other areas. So it could be taking one particular country, which is doing really well for them, and taking a revenue approach to that and having a marketing approach in a country where they're new. And it builds towards a long-term strategy. And it goes back to what you were saying. Um, if your revenue goals or ROI goals are being met, why wouldn't you keep putting money behind it? And I see that whenever there is a marketing channel involved in a hotel, that is never a case. There is never unlimited budget for marketing. For revenue activities, yes. <coughs> Percentage commission, absolutely. They can work with that. The minute it is a marketing amount, there is a budget. And there is a differentiation between marketing and revenue departments. It's still not working cohesively. I don't know if that's something that stands out, but when you talk to OTAs, that's not the case. They look at a channel as a mix of the two. So they look at Google or TripAdvisor as a revenue plus marketing channel. So they don't, they're not talking to us as revenue managers or marketing guys, they're talking to us as digital marketers. And that's a different way to look at it. The right way? Um, it's worked for certain, uh, well, it's working for OTAs. <laughs> Any OTAs in the room? No, okay. Now this has come up often that if hotels looked at everything they pay in commissions, yeah. margin and, ex you know, added that up and started saying, well, you know, that's a marketing cost, and uh, where do we redirect that? But today it's not, in, in general, I don't know, maybe I'm completely wrong, but in general it's not looked at it that way. It's and it's, it's tough, right? It's, it's tough, tough to make sure it's really allocated correctly, no? <coughs> it's, I think it would be fairly easy to calculate it. Okay. Yeah. Tell us. Sorry? <laughs> you want me to do it now? Tell yes. <laughs> You brought up an interesting thing here with marketing, revenue management, kind of being one. Yes. Right? In our pricing decisions, right? And maybe we go over to Thomas from, a, from an app perspective or from a uh, vendor of, uh, let's say, OTA kind of style. Do you see that being done at property level or is it really that you say, there is sometimes no logic. Um, well, you know, you asked the question in a way that you, you referred to earlier, which is future proof, right? And that's something that, you know, I also sort of resonates. It's do it, own it. You know, it's, it sounds like something that is set in stone. You do it once, you blend it for you, and it works forever. But it's really not the case. Like, I, I love your presentation. You start with it, and you look into, you know, how things move, and you see the kids predicting the future. You laugh at it. You know, you, you will see things change. So there's no such thing as do it, own it, that's it. It's more like do it, own it, okay, revise, learn again, and, and do it again, own it. But there's no static thing in it. So what do we, you know, if I, if I look across, we're, so we're, just to clarify, we're not an OTA. We are a different distribution channel. We are a mobile app, which is a closed group. It's mobile only, and it's only last minute, non cancelable et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not gonna market myself, but the way that we position ourselves is, is a different distribution channel to optimize basically for FPAR. And what I see across, um, it's, it's a huge differences. The joy is when you go from country to country and you go from hotel, hotel chains to another, and you see how they really perceive everything differently. There's no single strategy, one best practice, follow this rule. And I think that's in a certain way, that's where it gets really interesting. Because I think the moment that you fix it to one best practice, you find that this is really not something that might be suitable for you personally. You see something which is working, say, you know, in the neighboring hotel or neighboring country, and you go, oh, I go this way. But this might not be the right customer for you. This might not be the right acquisition channel. So what I find also from my perspective, we wouldn't bet just on, on one channel. What I think is, is really working is have a, have a clear vision where, you, where you're leading, clear vision what kind of value proposition you want to provide to your customer, and then try to test the acquisition channels and measure it and find out what's the, what's the ultimate cost of, of that. Okay. But isn't it, sometimes it, it nags me with mobile versus desktop versus uh, 
traditional sales channels, is it the same customer? And if it's not, how do we own that customer? Or who in general owns the customer for us today? Right? Because at the end of the day, we are the guys providing the service. Right? But so could OTA. So uh, rightly would you say yourself, I'm also providing a service in the entire, uh, so to speak, food chain. Right? But who owns the customer? What? The customer owns you. I mean, yeah, the, the I customer agree. ultimately is, is the person who decides he's going to book you know, on a, on a mobile app uh, last minute or he's going to call the hotel or he's... So I think that this concept of owning the customer is, is probably to some degree making the, the hotels feel good about it or the OTAs feel good about it. The customer is very independent. One thing that is... Um, that, that we all know is once the guy checks into the hotel, you own him, <laughs> which, is, which is good and bad. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the intermediaries, they don't really care about that part of the ownership, and that's probably the beautiful thing about it, is that they can spend all their money on, on 